What you're about to hear is a chilling story narrated by Dark Waters. Dark personally talks to these people that report these events. Sometimes he tells his personal story, and sometimes, every now and then, he'll play their actual voices. But what you're about to hear are stories of true accounts that happened. Keep in mind, Dark doesn't report and produce every story he has told. In fact, through a careful selection process, he has his own methods of detecting if the person reporting the experience is telling him true accounts of what they experienced, or if they're not. Prepare yourself for what you're about to hear. For more stories like these, head over to IamDarkWaters.com for more content from the King of Horror, Dark Waters. After the massive traffic jams that shut down highways, Atlanta is starting to go down the road to recovery. Today, drivers began retrieving the vehicles they'd abandoned on the side of icy, jam-packed roads. The governor took the heat for failing to prepare for the minor snow and ice storm that crippled the city. We have two reports from Atlanta tonight. First, Mark Strassman. Mark? Scott, major roads are open again, but most schools and businesses remain closed. Two days after two inches of uh, snow and ice paralyzed the city, Georgia's governor admitted he blew it. Georgia Governor Nathan Deal had defended the state's response for two days, but he admitted today that he had not closely followed the changing forecast. I did not know that it had been upgraded uh, and a more serious uh, warning had been issued. At 3.22 Monday afternoon, the National Weather Service put out a winter storm warning, one to two inches of snow in north central Georgia. But overnight, at 3.38 Tuesday morning, the update included all of Metro Atlanta and its five million residents. At 7.20 that morning, Atlanta Mayor Kasim Reed tweeted, Atlanta, we are ready for the snow. It began to fall around 11 a.m. Soon after, the governor tweeted this photo of him presenting Atlanta's mayor with a portrait as Georgian of the Year. By 2 p.m. Tuesday, schools, businesses, and government offices began to empty at once. The gridlock and accidents made it impossible to treat the roads with salt. Children spent the night in schools, stranded commuters in store aisles and their cars. Yes, we did not have adequate preparation to encounter the storm as it came in the time frame in which it came. Yes, I accept responsibility for that. Bogan Mitchell had to abandon his car and walk home on the ice. Do you think they just weren't paying attention? I just don't think they took it seriously. I don't think they really considered how bad it could happen to the city and that they were just lax in their uh, response time. want to know the worst thing about being trapped in a snowstorm now you may think it's the bitter cold temperatures or the violent wind bursts that hit you in your face but in all actuality it's the isolation you see in those type of situations your mind begins to wander playing your decisions over and over again in this endless loop at least that's how it was for me when a snowstorm hit georgia a few years ago you see, I worked in Cartersville, Georgia, about a 45-minute commute with traffic from my hometown of Marietta. That day in the news, they predicted that we were going to have a snowstorm, but overall, they undersold what was about to happen. They claimed it would be a few inches of snow and that everything would be fine. And although I feel as if the governor let us down, looking back on it, there was no way that they could have predicted everything that was going to happen. So I've been at work all day. Four o'clock rolls around. My boss, Jan, comes in and says he needs us all to go home early because he's been watching the news and he's starting to see these massive traffic jams. Jan tells us, God bless you and get home safely. Now, me, I had not been watching the news or listening to the radio. I had a very important report that I needed to get out. So I just wasn't paying full attention. I ended up leaving work at 445, way behind the gun when it came to getting into the traffic. And I found myself low on gas. After sitting in traffic for about 25 minutes, I was finally able to reach a gas station. When I pulled up to the pump, I discovered that the credit card machine wasn't working and they were only taking cash. Let me tell you something. Walking into that gas station 
this feeling rushed over me, an overwhelming sense that something big was about to happen. And looking back on that moment now that everything has transpired, what I was sensing was correct. And I should have heeded that warning. I get inside the gas station and everyone's on their cell phone. I'm overhearing conversations about people being stuck at work, kids that are stranded at their schools, and teachers having to stay behind because parents can't get to them. And I remember thinking to myself in that moment, thank God my family is in Florida. I don't know what the hell I would do if I found myself in that situation. My son stranded at school, my wife stranded at work, and I had to choose who I was going to go and get. That would be a horrific choice to make. If the emotions inside of that gas station were a microcosm for what people were feeling in a greater metro area, then I knew exactly what was going on. An overall sense of panic could be felt. It was tangible. People were on edge. And I wanted nothing more than to get out of that madness and get home. So in that moment, I devised a plan that would get me around all the traffic. And this plan would lead to me encountering something horrific. An experience unlike anything I could have ever imagined. My plan was to avoid all the traffic by cutting through Red Top Mountain State Park. And it should have been easy. Instead of merging on the interstate from Old Alabama Road, I would just go straight. Take Red Top Mountain Road to Glade Street down into Atworth, then take Main Street South, and I would be able to get to Marietta. In my mind, taking this route avoided all the congestion. Now, as I stood there pumping gas, that overwhelming feeling of panic came back again. This gut feeling that something was wrong. But I wrote it off, thinking it was nothing more than a combination of everyone else's emotions combined with this bitter cold that I was feeling. Now, the first issue I ran into was pulling out of the freaking parking lot. Traffic was crazy. And then when I finally got around to the other side of I-75, which took me to drive on the median a bit, there was literally no traffic. Was the road icy? Yes. But it wasn't anything I couldn't handle. Now, crossing Bethany Bridge was another story. That was a little dicey. And when I get off the bridge, there's a park ranger parked alongside of the road. Lights flash and he flags me down and says, Listen, the sun will be going down soon and the road ahead is getting really bad. Black ice is everywhere. It would be best if you turn around and went the other way. And my question to him was real simple. Well, sir, are you officially closing the roads? He raises his brow and look, he looks at me straight in the eyes and says, No, sir, the governor would have to declare a state of emergency in order for that to happen. But my experience tells me that you might get up the mountain, but going down is going to be a major problem. It's probably best if you head back. Now, I wasn't trying to be an asshole to this dude. Honestly, I wasn't. I just wanted to go home. But I know what I said came across a little asshole -ish. I tell him, listen, I'm a grown man and I can handle the consequences of my actions. I'll be fine. Then I rolled the window up and pulled off. Looking through the rearview mirror as I drove away, he just shook his head and talked to the next driver behind me. But I was determined to get home out of the storm. The uphill ride was a bit slippery and I was forced to creep along the roadway. That, combined with the snow really falling, was making my vision limited. But coming downhill on Glade Road is where I really had the problem. I hit a patch of ice. The car is just sliding down the freaking road. I'm twisting and turning the wheel, trying to guide it in the right direction, when I get to the intersection of Glade Road and Webster. Now, I didn't want to go into a ditch. So I cut the wheel hard left, hit the gas, thinking that I was going to spin towards the middle of the intersection, hit the brakes, and at least I wouldn't go off the road, right? Wrong. The car whips around, does a full 360 spin off the road, slams into a tree on the opposite side of the road. Look, the engine's running, but the car's smoking. I'm perfectly fine, but outside the wind is whipping, and it's no longer snow that's falling, it's wind-driven snow. Now, I was physically fine, but I would soon realize that this was only the beginning of one of the most terrifying nights of my life. The first thing I did was reach for my cell phone to call a tow truck, but the network was busy. But little did I know at that time that the greater metro Atlanta area was in the grip of one of the worst snowstorms in its history. 
I tried the phone three more times, but the network was busy. So I stepped outside of the car to take a closer look at the damage. Ruthless blasts of wet snow and ice bombarded my face as I stood there. I could smell the fluid leaking from the engine, and that's when this harsh reality set in. Smoke began to fill the interior of my vehicle, and I knew I was screwed. And the only way that I could get to help was to walk to a neighborhood about three to four miles away, downhill in this weather. Now in that moment, I start to freak out just a little bit, and I need you to understand why. It's not like I'm on the side of some busy highway. There are no cars passing by. And on top of that, there's no street lights. If you don't believe me, look this shit up. It was pitch black out there. Lucky for me, I always kept an emergency kit in the trunk of my car, which included a flashlight. But turning that flashlight on while it was snowing made it even more freaking creepy. I felt like I was in that movie, you know, uh, what's the name of it? Uh, Silent Hill, the one where there was this crazy ash falling from the sky. Remember how quiet and eerie it was in that movie? That's exactly what I was experiencing. Every time I took a footstep, it crunched and echoed on the snow. But as I reached into my glove compartment, grabbed my revolver, closed and locked the doors to my car, I resolved in my mind that I was going to make that three to four mile walk no matter what. And I was going to find someone's front door, knock on it, and get help. Turning and walking away from the car, I remembered. I had my thermos in my trunk filled with boiling hot coffee from the gas station. So I hustled back to the trunk, opened it up, grabbed the thermos, and slid it down into my jacket. And the heat from that thermos felt absolutely amazing, warming the core of my body. And for the first 200 yards, I was hopeful. But that's when it happened. The first twig snapped. And in that dark, still night, it didn't even sound like wood breaking. It was so loud that it had a ring to it. Shining the flashlight in the direction of the noise, nothing could be seen but snow I take another few steps this time moving slowly and softly but each step crunches loudly echoing in the still night then I hear it again crack the clear sound of wood being snapped this time it's coming from in front of me on the left hand side hello hello is someone there I speed up my pace, moving to the far right side of the road. And that damn flashlight made things worse. I can't explain it, but this feeling came over me. You know that feeling like you're being surrounded? Now in that moment, I didn't have any evidence. All I heard was twigs and branches snapping. For all I knew, it could have been tree branches snapping from the weight of the snow. But in that moment, I felt panic. This intense need and urge to run. But I didn't. I stayed calm and I quickened my pace, each step sounding louder and louder. Before I knew it, I was trotting along the side of the road. The ground was so slippery, snow battering my face. In front of me, darkness. Behind me, the same thing. And then the growling started, first behind me. Then another growl up ahead of me coming from the left-hand side of the road. I moved off the road down into a ditch. But there was no more fighting the panic. I started to run. 15 yards later, blam, I'm face down in the snow and mud. As I lay there face down, my body shivering from the cold, the coffee from a the thermos spills down my pants. And I can't explain it to you, but that heat against my skin jolted me somehow. I was mad. I rolled over my back, pulled my revolver, and fired two shots into the air. Blam! Blam! Standing, I screamed, you might get me, but I'm going to put a bullet in your ass. The sound of the gunfire is still ringing in my ear. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Dark Waters, and I'm back. For you members at IamDarkWaters.com, if you did get the email, if you didn't get the notification from the website, 
I'm telling you now here on YouTube, head on over and listen to the whole story. For those of you who haven't signed up and haven't become a member yet, listen, man, I don't know what to tell you. You got to get it together, baby. $4.99. It's cheap. It's the same price as a cup of coffee. Tomorrow morning, one of y'all going to get up, ride in the Starbucks uh, drive through and going to ask for a caramel latte, mocha lata, chocolata. You're going to want cinnamon and cream and all the rest of that tomorrow when you buying that coffee and whatever little biscuit you get because on average it's gonna cost you ten dollars when you start eating and start drinking i want you to think to yourself man i could have bought the membership to dark waters with one of these trips i'm spending four five ten dollars a day going to starbucks almost three hundred dollars a month maybe in some cases a hundred dollars a month i could have gave dark waters four ninety nine help them grow out this platform and make things happen. For those of you who are not aware, there's a reason why we're building our own platform. Go back and look at what's going on on YouTube. I'm not going to reiterate it. I'm not going to go over it all again. Because those who know, know those who don't know. Then you just don't understand. But join the family, baby. Hop on the Dark Waters train. It's moving and it's going to keep moving. It ain't going nowhere. I love those of you who've already supported. I appreciate each and every one of you who listen on YouTube. And for those of you who don't want to support, I still love you anyway, baby. God bless you. It's your boy, Dark Waters, and I'm out.